On October 17, 1931, a notorious gangster named Al Capone, Fonz, was sentenced to prison for tax evasion. As he serves out a sentence, his mental and physical state deteriorates as a result of neurosyphilis. And, after spending 10 years in prison, he is deemed no longer a threat to society as a result of his illness, and he is released to live in his Florida mansion with his wife, May. Once he reunites with his family, all the close and extended members visit him for Thanksgiving, filling the otherwise solemn mansion with love, laughter, and good memories. During the celebration, his estranged teenage son, Tony, calls him from Cleveland under the watchful eyes of the police, but their conversation doesn't produce any sentimental value as Al responds coldly. A few days after the holidays, May, together with the house staff, starts organizing and preparing the different valuable statues and paintings of the mansion for sale so that the family could live off the proceeds as they have no other source of income. Al's health deteriorates rapidly to the point that he finds himself spacing out, hallucinating, and frequently had issues with incontinence. Hence, Al spends most of his time on the dock in front of the mansion, overlooking the lake and trying to sort the thoughts in his mind and make sense out of them. As the days go by, Al starts feeling like he is being followed wherever he goes, and he even feels like there are people in the woods watching his every move. This feeling starts to get to Al, makes him paranoid, and causes him to flip out on the staff around him, except May, who expertly and kindly looks after him. One night, May makes sure Al has his dinner and gets him to bed early so that he can rest well. The next day, May calls the family physician, Dr. Carlock, to report the events of the previous night, which led Al to lose control of his bowel movements. The doctor comes to the mansion to check on Al, and concludes that the deterioration is expected, and suggests that his patients start wearing diapers, while advising May to try to keep Al's environment as stable as possible. That afternoon, as Al sits by the lake, he hallucinates about his dear friend Johnny and believes he has come to visit him and keep him company for a couple of days. After chit-chatting with Johnny, Al suggests they go fishing and they start on their way. Once they get to their destination, to the shock of Johnny, Al blurts out that he has hidden $10 million before he went to prison but that he doesn't remember where. Later that day, May accompanies Al as he watches a movie in the cinema room until the power goes out. Al then excuses himself to go to the bathroom and navigates through the dark to go on his own. Al shakes off what he sees, returns to his seat on the porch, and continues talking to Johnny in his mind while May runs inside to answer a silent call from Cleveland. All of a sudden, Al screams for May to get him a drink, and the two get in a fight where Al spits in her face. Angered, May slaps Al, but is shocked when he falls down from the impact. May cries as she apologizes to Al and gets him to bed, nursing his wounds until the police come to check on their welfare as a result of a voice complaint. While May deals with the police, in the bedroom, as Al increasingly faces difficulties differentiating reality from imagination, he calls the police and inaudibly reports that he has kidnapped a child, which confuses both the cop receiving the call and those listening in. Al then abruptly shuts down the phone and follows an imaginary young boy out of the bedroom, while May calls out for him, wondering where he is. How about it for our good friend Al? As Al's hallucination grows more vivid, he feels himself joining the party crowd, singing with them for a bit, and making his way out of the crowd for a breath of fresh air, and heads to the bathroom, where one of his henchmen, named Gino, comes in to meet him, refers to him as the boss, and takes him to the holding room. Al is led out of the room with a dumbfounded look on his face as he has no idea who any of the men are or the meaning and significance of the actions that just took place. As Al reaches a hallway, he is met by a young woman who comes on to him and proceeds to seduce him. <laughs> Al leaves the woman's body behind and as he exits the room, he's confused to find himself back in the party room where all the attendants now lay dead on the floor. He then navigates himself out to the street and sees a young boy standing a few miles away. Al tries to make his way to the boy through the dead bodies while informing him that his mom is hurt. May discovers Al lying on the floor and quickly gets him to bed. Dr. Carlock examines Al, who informs both his family and the cops, who pressure him to find out where Al's treasure is, that Al had a second, more detrimental stroke. 
The doctor then holds a family meeting with the Capones to discuss his case in detail and explain the new lifestyle adjustments they need to make to support Al. The family vows to stand by May and help her through the process as the doctor details that Al has suffered from a permanent motor injury that causes serious paralysis in different parts of his body and advises that he should start physiotherapy to minimize the impact and possibly reverse the damage. He also forbids the gravely ill man from ever smoking again and instead proposes that they should give him a carrot to chew on to soothe his addiction instead. As the family collects itself and prepares for what's ahead, the insensitive doctor tries to trap Al in a recording that the police monitor and starts to spend time with him in art therapy, hoping to get his patient to reveal the location of the treasure. After Al draws a couple of innocent drawings, the doctor presents him with a bag full of money and demands him to draw it, which elicits a reaction in Al, who can't do much more than make desperate sounds. A few minutes in, Al's son, Junior, comes to spend more time with his father, and Al tries to alert him to the doctor's motives by chewing on the carrots. The doctor then gives the father and son the room so that they can enjoy each other's company. Junior goes through his father's drawing, appreciating his attempts, until he gets to one that has the name Tony loosely scribbled across it, and hears his father claim that Tony is his son. A couple of days later, Ralph spends time with Al and asks him where the treasure is so that they can find it and support their living before the police find it. He then inadvertently fuels Al's paranoia by telling him that he no longer trusts Gino and his men as he feels like everyone is waiting for their downfall. Later, Junior approaches his mother and informs her about Tony, but May reassures her son by telling him that he is Al's only son and that the drawing is probably a figment of Al's imagination. Later that day, as the family sits for dinner, Gino arrives late and joins them to the dismay of Al, who freaks out at the sight of his once right-hand man. The family asks the shocked Gino to leave as soon as possible, rushes to Al to get him off the floor and put him to bed, and leaves quickly so that he can rest. However, a few minutes later, Al starts hallucinating about all the murders he has committed, as if he's being broadcast on the radio, and is joined by Johnny once more. After listening to the murder reports together, Johnny shares his disappointment in Al for the way he suspected him of being an informant to the police and having him executed. Johnny reminds Al how long they have known each other and thanks him for getting him off the streets and giving him a better life. After a few minutes of chit-chatting, Johnny gets up and approaches Al's bed as Al watches in confusion. Al screams in terror at what he perceives is happening in real time, shocking the family into running into his room and calming him down. Elsewhere, young, ambitious FBI agent Agent Sterling Crawford convinces his superiors to speak to Al, both to investigate the whereabouts of the treasure and confirm his rumored insanity. He then goes to the mansion, accompanied by his partner, and is met by Al and his lawyer, Mr. Mattingly. As the interview begins, Agent Sterling keeps things by the book, but Al fails to comprehend and state his name and age, which prompts the lawyer to answer for his client. Seeing that it's not going anywhere, Agent Sterling takes the interview off record and asks Al straight up where the treasure is, reciting that neither he nor his family is deserving of the kind of life they lead, as none of them are well-educated and never even held a regular job in their life until Al loses control of his facilities and the interview is forced to be cut short. The next day, May gets the usual call from Cleveland, but hears a voice this time, which prompts her to ask if Tony is on the other side of the call. However, this interaction is interrupted as Ralph runs to May, panicked, and informs her that he took his eyes off Al for just a moment and that now he is missing. May, together with the rest of the family, Dr. Carlock and the staff, runs around the large property, looking for Al and hoping that they can get to him soon. Mayhem ensues as everyone rushes around the property in panic, trying to locate where the shots came from. However, Al walks in behind the group with a vintage shotgun in hand. As everyone hides in fear, Gino gets out of his hiding, trying to calm down his boss, but it backfires as Al starts going mad, shoots him multiple times, and kills him. Al then goes to the lake and continues shooting at the men watching him from the woods and generally everyone and everything in his surroundings until he falls into the water as a result of the ricochet.
Al manages to swim to dry land and once again sees the young boy. Moments later, Al regains consciousness and is relieved to realize that all that transpired since his meeting with the agents was a hallucination and that he was stopped right after he shot his gardener in the foot. In the following few days, all the valuables are sold out of the mansion to make extra cash for living and for the upcoming Thanksgiving celebration, where the whole extended family once again reunites at the mansion to celebrate together. Later that night, Tom comes to the mansion to visit his father and May escorts the young boy to the porch, where, as usual, Al sits looking out. The father and son hold hands, grateful to finally be in each other's company. After Al's death, Many of his family members changed their names and moved away, and the coveted treasure was never found. The end. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.